so today we have Kedar talking about um, Velda, Podman, Scopio, Docker, and uh, what else? So I am going to share the recording. And this is a pre-recorded session for DevCon 30 US. Today I'm here to talk to you about container technologies. I'm suspecting a lot of you there in my audience are basically trying to learn these technologies. Everybody has heard of containers. Everybody has heard of Docker containers. But are those the only containers? That's what you really want to learn. Um, or do you want to learn from can? Right? So those are the kind of questions you have. You don't know where to start. You don't know what technologies are out there. Maybe you have never heard of some of the other technologies listed here on this slide. Like you have heard of Docker. Have you heard of Formal, Builda, Opio? What do they do? Why do I need those? Those are the kind of questions you might have. And I'm going to help you understand what these technologies exactly do. So as I said, I'm Kedar Kulkarni. I have been at Red Hat for more than four years. I work for management business unit. This business unit is where a lot of automation offerings are uh, being developed and offered to the customers, such as Ansible, Cloud Forms, Satellite, Insights, and so on. A lot of my personal interest lies within infrastructure and automation, and I'm also very much interested in the containers as technology, as you can tell from these slides. So what is containers? Basically, we are going to compare containers with virtualization. Virtualization is where you may have used on your laptop or in your data center where you deploy a hypervisor. Or if you have a laptop, if you have the host operating system as Windows, you might want to install a virtualization software such as VMware or Oracle uh, VirtualBox. And these softwares allow you to create a virtual machine inside your laptop, inside your Windows operating system, where you create a Linux operating system based virtual machine. So basically you install Linux in a virtual machine on your laptop, which is running the host oper operating system as Windows. Similar concept applies in the data center virtualization as well, just not your laptop. But what happens is in the virtualization, each virtual machine is going to have its own guest operating system layer installed which is being highlighted here on the slides. And this layer is gonna be a huge and heavy layer that has to be installed and carried with the virtual machine. And then on the top of that, you can run your application or you, you can do your thing, whatever you really want to use that virtual machine for. But as you can guess that this virtual machine is really a complete machine because it has a complete guest operating system installed. And that makes it really heavy it is sometimes slow to start, slow to respond overall, can cause a lot of resource utilization on your underlying host on your laptop. And it is not always fast as you would want it to be. Now, come in containers. Containers become really popular in recent years when they were introduced first by Docker. Um, but containers as a technology has been around for a lot longer. What containers do for you is really that it gets rid of that host operating system layer. That layer is replaced by supporting files and the runtime, but these are really lightweight runtimes as compared to the virtual machine itself. You're not installing an entire operating system, but you're sharing the underlying operating system between containers. And that allows you to have something called a container that that is a execution unit which is very tiny very quick to respond within a matter of seconds it's up and running you can basically see them as ephemeral virtual machines that really come on really fast and work really nicely for you i know there are some of you who might already know these things and they might cringe if i say they are like virtual machines because they are not but for the sake of argument today, we are going to say that they're kind of like virtual machine. Anyways, let's look at the next slide. We are going to look at what Docker is. Docker is a container software that was launched in 2013 in public. It was founded in 2010, really, and it was made open source. They were using something called LXC underlying 
that was the container runtime the the runtime is basically where the container execution is managed the thing that manages all the containers is kind of the runtime in the loose terms and now then they moved to their own execution environment execution runtime which was written in go currently docker is open source under the project called moby m o b y as listed here on the slide and it is open source project so docker has an enterprise edition as well as the open source project moby or it has a docker community edition what docker did for a lot of us is it introduced us to the container technologies although a lot of what docker does or uses underneath or a container really uses underneath is some of the linux system features in the linux we have features such as c groups namespaces and so on so there are some features of linux that have been around forever and those features were used to create these containers and docker really made it easy for everyone to use it and that's why the containers become popular in late years so before containers virtualization was the only way to have more effective utilization of your softwares or have more effective utilization of your bare metal resources so Docker made it more efficient by taking it a step further using the containers. Because if you can fit five virtual machines on a system, maybe you can fit 500 containers on a system. That could be the scale difference, and that's how efficient it could be. Now that you know what Docker is, let's look at a little bit more into its architecture. There are three main components. There is a Docker host, there is a Docker client, and there is a Docker registry. Now the Docker host is the computer, like your computer in this case would, would be acting as a Docker host. So what Docker host has is it has a, like a daemon running. It's a service that's running on your laptop. It's called Docker daemon. And this service is constantly up and running and it is responsible for managing all your containers, all your images, etc. But then when it comes to the images, the docker images or the in the in the terms of virtual machines if you were to get an iso file or dot iso extension file from somewhere and download that and use to create the operating system and the virtual machine similar to that in the registry we have docker images where you can have multiple different images present that are available publicly for you to download so as you can see here on the screen there is a Ubuntu image in the registry that we have showed here in the diagram. There is a CentOS, there is an Nginx and so on. So these images basically help you create the Docker container. So to create any container, you need to always get the image that you need for that container. Then here on the left hand side, what we have is a Docker client. Docker client is when you as a person trying to execute some docker command you are acting as a client to the docker host or the docker daemon if you tell docker to run a particular docker container if you execute this docker run command what happens is it tries to connect to docker daemon docker daemon if it has permission uh, if you have enough permissions docker daemon will respond to you and it will start helping you understand how it's working it will try to create that container for you it will first say it is checking if the container image exists so now if you ask that hey i want to execute a centos docker container and now docker daemon is going to be like hmm maybe i don't have that container image so it's going to connect to the docker registry it's going to take that image down from there it's going to basically download all the content of that image from the docker registry and store it in the local container image storage and then use that image to create a running container the next time when you execute the same command it's going to find that container image in the local docker storage cache and it's going to be able to use that to create the container and doesn't really need to talk to the registry in the second time and so on so that's how the docker works Docker has a client server model where you act as a client or any system that's executing the Docker commands acts as a client to the Docker daemon, which is the server in this case. 
and everything goes through the docker daemon every command is basically routed to the docker daemon which takes care of everything that you are asking it to do and then it returns you the results so next we are going to talk about podman so what is podman podman is another technology which is very similar to docker but it is very different but simply put if you look at the website for podman or its documentations it tells you it is basically alias for docker what that means is that if you know docker you know podman already and making that switch is really easy you just go into your bash profile after installing podman and basically write the alias docker equal to podman save it and next time you start using docker commands it will start using podman internally that's how it, easy it is to switch podman is also an open source project and some of the important reasons that it was created for are listed here so podman itself is a daemonless software unlike docker you don't need to run the client versus server model it uses a different model which is fork exec model now that is a linux operating system level terminology or basically operating system level detail that you can read there on the slides when i when you click on the more info when i share the slides with you but for now it is important to understand that Docker and Podman use different mechanisms on the backend to execute the Docker containers. Both of them support Docker containers, but Podman also supports OCI container image format. So what is OCI? OCI is an open container initiative, and that was created by multiple industry leading companies who are interested in having a common container image format. So Podman basically supports both of them. So if you are familiar with the Docker file, you can keep writing the Docker file as you always did, and it will still work under Podman. Podman helps you as a user, not only do the containers on your system as you already did always, but it also helps you move into the Kubernetes. It has a special command that helps you generate YAMLs that can be compatible or that could act as a boilerplate for you to move from Podman or docker world to the kubernetes or openshift world we are going to see that a little bit in the demo but let's learn a little bit more about podman so podman is daemonless meaning that you don't have a single point of failure you don't have security vulnerabilities uh, that are there in the daemon so if the docker daemon stops working your entire docker environment fails nothing like that would happen in podman if the docker daemon is compromised all of your containers are compromised we don't have that problem in podman and in the docker versus podman world there is an important distinction as well that a docker daemon is running as a root level privileged user but in podman you don't have that kind of issue if you are trying to use docker and if you are not root you have to add your user into the docker group which has a lot of higher level of privileges in the operating system and that at that point you are at the mercy of the security mechanism implemented in the docker daemon which is not a very uh, favorable proposition in in terms of the podman podman doesn't really like it podman doesn't really have that issue because it is running a fork exec model it doesn't have a server or client model it doesn't have that same kind of daemon that has to be running it doesn't require you to have special permissions everything is different in the podman and yet is all same it is basically very similar to docker for you as a user but at the back end it is very much more secure and very different from Docker. so that's podman for you another important distinction that i'm going to also highlight in the slides here and in the uh, demos later is that docker uses a global image cache on your docker host on all your laptop but within podman you don't have that issue for podman there is a separate image cache for each different user so each user can have their own set of images and they don't really have to be globally made available to all users so your images will be stored within your home directory on your system 
and no other users will see it. That's also an added feature of Bondman. Here in this diagram, we can see that this diagram looks a lot more different than what the Docker diagram was looking at when we looked at that earlier. So in here, what you basically need to understand is Podman CLI is not acting as a client, but it is just a command that you're executing. And then Podman itself uh, basically creates the child containers or child processes using the fork exec model. And when you stop the container, all the Podman processes exit. Basically, this all, all basically exit from your uh, process tree and there is nothing running if there is no container running. Versus in Docker, even if you're not running anything, there is a Docker process, Docker service, the daemon is always running and it has to be running in order for you to be able to do any Docker operations. So that's the important distinction that we are highlighting here on this, this particular slide. Now we are gonna look at the demo. So let me switch to the demo screen for all of you. In this demo, we are checking first, who am I? I'm logged in as my own user, A. Kulkarni. Then I'm trying to run Podman command, Podman RM, uh, hello world latest. Basically what we are doing here is, we are trying to run a new uh, Docker container using Podman command. And we are telling that we want to remove this container as soon as its processes are exited. So it, if you do Podman PS, this container will no longer be there if it is exited. You, you don't have to do that, but you can. It's just for having the sanity. You don't need to do it all the time. I do it because it's my personal preference. But what you is, you're seeing here on the screen is that I'm running a Fedora 32 operating system on my host, on my laptop. And then on the next line, I'm running the Podman run command for the hello world latest image. And it's a Docker image. That's why it says hello from Docker, but it's running with the Podman is interesting right now what we are going to do next is we are highlighting that we are trying to run docker command for the same image and what happens is i don't have docker installed so i have to install that it says docker command not found so i'm going to install the mobi engine which is the open source version of docker and installing that enables me to run the docker command but for that, there is also another distinction. On the Fedora 32, there was a different C group version that was being supported or used as compared to what Docker would support. So I have already applied that workaround and that workaround is listed in the slides and I will share that in the notes with you after the talk. But using that workaround, I was able to downgrade the version of C groups I'm using temporarily, temporarily for this demo and I got my Mobi engine working. Now that we have installed this engine and I have already pre-applied that workaround, I try to run the Docker command again, but it fails, it says permission denied. And this could be potentially because maybe the daemon is not running or maybe I don't have enough permissions. So I'm gonna make sure the daemon is running. So I do systemctl start Docker. I need to have enough privileges to do that. And once the daemon is started, I can try to execute the Docker command again, but this may not work again because what happens is even though the daemon is running, we are going to see that um, the Docker basically needs to have special permissions. It needs me to have my group as Docker or me need my user needs to be part of the Docker group before it allows me to interact with the Docker daemon and do anything with the Docker containers. So now what I'm doing is, I'm basically adding myself into the Docker group and I switched my group to Docker. And you can see, as I highlighted here, my GID or group says that I have Docker group in my additional groups, apart from my previous groups that I had. Now, basically what happened is, I was able to execute the Docker command because I was made part of the group. This is the part where I was talking about the special privileges that are required for me to interact with the Docker. Now we are gonna look at another demo. So in this demo, we are gonna see how the Docker images and the Podman images differ. So let me start this video. Here in this demo, we are seeing the Docker images first. If I run the Docker images command, 
I see that I have hello world image that's present in my Docker image cache. Now, next thing is I run Podman images. Now you see that Podman images are much more there because I always use Podman over Docker nowadays, and I have a lot more images in my Podman's image cache. But both of them are different, and this is an important distinction. They are not using the same image cache. Now, if I go a step further, and if I decide to pull a new image using Podman, I'm pulling the Alpine image, which is really a tiny image that you can quickly pull down. And if I do Docker images again, it's not there. This goes on to highlight that Docker and Podman are in fact having that different image cache. And if I do the Podman images, I can see that Alpine image. So this concludes our second demo. In this demo, we basically saw how the Docker and Podman caches are different for the different, uh, having the different images. So they both allow you to have own different set of images and they don't share the common cache. All right. In this third demo, we are going to see an advanced feature of Podman. So let's start the uh, video here. As you can see, I have listed the demo3.sh script on the right hand side of the terminal. In there, you can see what all commands we are going to execute. But I want to execute them one after the other so that I can show you the effect of each command individually. Now I have aliased docker equal to podman. So if I do which docker, it tells me it is doing docker equal to podman. So it's telling me that it's running podman for everything now, even though if I say docker. If I do Docker images, I see no images. If I do Podman images, I see no images. I had cleared all my images in the Podman uh, image cache, as we saw in the previous video. We don't have any of those images anymore. Hence, the image cache is zero. There are no images, and we are pulling our first image here. So if I do Docker pull, it's really pulling a new Docker image, but using the Podman image cache and Podman commands. So now that I'm running Docker images and Podman images individually, both of them actually do the same output because it is working as an alias. Now, the next thing we are going to do is we are going to try to run this Docker uh, container and we are using this Docker run command, which is internally reading that as Podman run command. And it has few parameters. So let me help you understand those. So we have dash dash rm, which is kind of my favorite. It gets rid of the container as soon as container stops executing. Then the next thing we have here is dash dash name. It is completely optional to have that, but I have decided to give it a name. So that's a random name that I came up with. And you can name your container however you want. It doesn't have to be anything specific. And hence the dream itchy. So the next thing is dash d, which tells that hey, run this container in a daemon mode. Run it in the background. Don't run it in the front or the foreground of my terminal. So as soon as container command is fired, it creates the container, puts it in the background, and returns your control back to the terminal. And that's what is happening here. I'm telling my podman right now that, hey, I want a Fedora 31 Docker container and name it as Dreamy Cheetah. And then when the container comes up, you run sleep command with 600 seconds, which is like 10 minutes. So this container is going to be around for 10 minutes. Now, what we are going to do next is that we are going to do Docker exec and we are using a bash shell to drop into the running container. Now that you can see my prompt has changed and I'm running, I'm inside that running container. So if I do cat etc red hat dash release tells me I'm on Fedora 31, which is what it should be, right? Because we are running a Fedora 31 container and I just dropped into that container. But if you check my host operating system, I'm actually on Fedora 32, as you see here. So basically Docker or containers, basically in general are giving us ability to switch between the operating systems and versions as we need and have that isolation. So anything that's running inside the container is running on a Fedora 31 uh, based operating system, but anything on my system itself is Fedora 30. And you could have Ubuntu, you could have CentOS. That's the beauty of containers. Now the next thing is a added nugget and 
it doesn't really have to be part of this talk, but I, I wanted to show you this as an advanced feature of Podman. Podman has ability to basically allow you to go from a pod to Kubernetes or OpenShift environment. As I'm highlighting on the right side, I'm going to use docker generate cube command, which is basically podman generate cube command. And this is a podman specific command. If you were not aliasing docker equal to podman, this command would not work. Now, for, for me to be able to deploy this on the OpenShift, I have already installed the origin clients using the command that's, uh, that's dnf install dash y origin clients as I'm highlighting here on the next slide using my mouse pointer. But this command is already installed for me. So I have the OC client installed and I'm able to use it out of the box. I have already logged in to our OpenShift cluster, which you would need to do in case you were to use this to deploy a pod on OpenShift. But we created this cube demo.yaml and in this cube demo.yaml we are trying to use OC create dash f to create that pod on the OpenShift environment. We are trying to basically create that Fedora 31 pod in OpenShift versus my laptop. But it is throwing some errors and that's one of the things that you need to remember that when you are using the generate cube command, you may not always have the perfect uh, YAML format that would be consumed by your OpenShift environment or you might need to add or remove a thing or two. And that's what we are gonna do next. I'm going to open this uh, cube demo.yaml file. I'm going to remove the security context, uh, AC Linux options altogether, as well as remove the uh, second object or the thing that is treating as an object, uh, creation timestamp and etc. because it doesn't really need to be there. It is not an object and hence it is not having the object field kind, which is the OC command is complaining about. Now that we have done that, we are able to use OC create dash F and create the new pod on OpenShift. And is, as you can see with OC get pods, I can actually see that pod is coming up and it's running and it's been there for eight seconds thus far. Now we are going to look at trying to get into that running container or running pod on the OpenShift. So with RSH, with OC RSH command, I was able to get into that running pod and I used Dreamy Cheetah, which was the name of that pod, to get inside it. So I'm basically inside inside a shell uh, environment within that pod, and I can check if I am there by running cat etc red hat release. And yes, of course I'm there. So there, there you see that I was able to go from Podman to OpenShift fairly easily with a little bit of knowledge of OpenShift. And that's the beauty of uh, podman generate cube command. Now, the last thing I'm doing here is I'm just deleting that pod and cleaning up after my usage so that my OpenShift environment is clean as it always should be. And as you can see here, the pod is terminating and that also concludes our demo. So thus far, we saw that how Docker and podman work. We saw three different demos of different uh, commands and different options within Docker and podman. So there are some other technologies as well, which is Builda and Scopio. And that's what we are going to look at now. So on this slide, we are going to look at Builda. Builda basically comes from the Boston accent of uh, the creator of Builda, which really means builder. And a builder, as a builder, it is able to build Docker container images for you or container images for you. So you would ask me, wouldn't Podman be able to build the images? Yes, Podman can build the images for you, but Builda was created just for building images. Podman does much more than that. And Builda was created before Podman. It existed before Podman. So uh, with Podman, you explicitly only be able to uh, create the images using a Docker file or OCI compliant uh, Docker file or image file or there is an added feature in the builder where it actually lets you create a container using command line. So you don't only have to create the containers using the uh, builder bud command, which is similar to Docker build commands, but you can actually use a command line interface where you can execute one command at a time and each of that command contributes to your container image that is being built. That is 
easy and that is really a fun way of building images if you're really new and you're trying to understand how to write the uh, first container image or if you're trying to create a complex image what happens is if you write a docker file and if you make a mistake in the docker file you'd have to rerun that docker file by amending your mistakes and you'd have to be in that loop create the docker file try to build doesn't work fix the failure try again doesn't work fix the failure try again and that loop continue but in this case with the builder you are able to get away from that loop using the builder cli to build the container images using your command line interface now um, you can use docker files as well i'm not saying you cannot but it's an added feature in the builder to use command line interface the next thing that we are going to see is why does builder exist so when kubernetes as a, a community decided to move to crio based oci specifications so crio is a runtime and oci is a container image specifications the open container initiative um, that made the docker less useful to the kubernetes environment or kubernetes community they decided to move from docker daemon to something else they had also moved from uh, docker daemon for running the containers to run c as a container runtime so they, they did not need the docker daemon to run the containers so the only thing that they needed to the docker container uh, runtime for or the docker daemon for was to build the images and with the introduction of builda they no longer needed that builda was able to do what docker daemon does in terms of building the images without actually requiring the docker daemon and that removed all the docker container related or daemon related security issues that we had in the kubernetes and that's why builda exists builda existed because it wanted they wanted to get rid of the docker daemon and wanted to use run c and uh, cryo and oci and everything that was open source and having much more uh, features and much less security vulnerability possible so let's look at another demo in this demo we are going to see how we are building two different container images using a very similar uh, format one using the docker file and another using the builda command line uh, and both of them are going to yield the exact same images with the exact same sizes so let's look at that so in this demo we are going to see how builda works now here what i have is a uh, docker file in this docker file i'm showing you that this is a really simple flask application that's going to just run a hello world.py on the port 3333 so in the demo uh, 5.sh here what i have is i have a um, command to install builda first once the builda is installed i'm able to go from there and um, start using builda to build images. So I'm using here builda bird, which is the build command in the builda to build a new Docker container image using that Docker file that we saw above. And it is really similar in this in, in terms of syntax with the podman build or Docker build commands. Now it is same or kind of very similar on how it is building the images in this particular format. And I am tagging this as Docker file tag so i know that this is built using the docker file but then builda also has a different method of building the images and that is using the cli as i have been uh, telling you about so we are going to build another image which is hello world colon builda cli and it's going to have exact same things as this image has but it's just build process is different now, as you can see, we have created both the images and both images are stored with different tags and different hashes at the end here. So you saw the same thing happening twice on the screen and they were happening in two different contexts, one using the Docker file, another using the CLI. So CLI makes it kind of easier for you to debug and build the container images in more interactive fashion. And that's an important advantage that you get out of this builder uh software 
but if you look at the uh, docker images that are there or really podman images they are because i use docker equal to podman as an alias we have two different hello world images and both of them are exact same size 918 megs that happens because no matter what the process of building is we are basically doing the exact same thing and we have got exact same docker images out of two different approaches of building it and now we are going to try to run those images and see if they show us that a flask server is running and there we go i have a builder cli based tag based image that i am about to run i'm port forwarding double three double three from my local system to within the container and there we have it the container is running we have the flask server that is running on that port that we specified and if i were to click that uh, url it's gonna try to look go to localhost double three double three and we are gonna see the logs out here that say that it requ received a get request there it is we see there are two different get requests that were arrived one for the forward slash or basically the home page itself which was responded with 200 and the other one was for icon which we did not have so it was with 404 but we can see that it was running using the container that was using the builder cli based docker container that we built now i'm gonna run the other container which was built using the docker file itself in the standard approach and we have the same results again so this goes on to show you that no matter how you are building the images you can get the exact same results out of builder at the end it's just about your preference on how you want to use this so you can use docker file or you can use the cli that concludes our demo about builder okay so the last item that we have here in the presentation is copio copio is basically a tool that allows you to copy the images from one storage mechanism to other storage mechanism basically it allows you to copy a docker image from maybe a docker hub to a private registry to quay.io to your local system between registries and so on and it also allows you to inspect the container images so those are kind of the main features of scopio and that's why it was created podman or docker cannot do that by itself it also allows you to delete images from a container registry and so on. So we are going to quickly go into a demo for Scopio. Now, in this demo, what we have is we are running another demo script that I had written. And here we are first installing Scopio. By installing Scopio, I am able to do what we uh, saw earlier as features of Scopio. First, I am able to inspect a container image, which is Fedora latest. And if I do that, I get all the metadata as you can see here. In this, you're seeing that what all tags are available for you in this image. So we have 30, 31, 32, latest, 33, etc. We have the container image name, it's digest, which is the shasam. And then we have some other information like the container image format, it has uh, OCI format here so that's one of the things that you can do with scopio you can inspect an image without actually having to pull that image to your system locally so you're not downloading the image but you're just downloading the metadata and reading that and showing that here on the screen the other thing that you can do is you can use scopio to log in to your um, docker and quay registries and once you log into that you are able to use scopio copy command to copy a docker image from your docker hub to quay or quay to docker hub or any of the different permutations and combinations of different container registries or storage backends and that's what we are doing here in this one i'm basically copying a image that i had in docker hub as i'll show you in a bit in the web browser and then taking that from here to the quay registry or quay repositories that i have so here you're seeing in the quay i don't have the hadoop image which i had in the docker so with the scopio copy command if, if i i want to copy the image from one place to other place i can do that and as as soon as i hit refresh here you can see now that hadoop image was present 
it is being copied it is not completely done yet but it's copying that image from docker to quay it's that easy that's one of the important features and why would you use copio so as you can see the image copy is still happening so i'm going to fast forward and it's going to finish the copying and the image is going to become available and fully usable from quay as well as docker so that concludes our last demo now that we have seen all the container related technologies and tools the next question you might ask is what to do next how do i start so i would suggest that pick a technology of your choice and if you don't have preference pick podman and learn it's really for everyone it doesn't have to be you don't have to be a particular uh, kind of person you don't have to be a sysadmin or a devops engineer to learn these if you are a developer if you are a quality engineer if you are just a new student this is really for everyone these are really beneficial for you to make your uh, lives easier uh, in terms of development or doing your day to day job uh, exploring new technologies sharing software etc so learn podman and understand that containers is not equal to docker docker were the one of the first companies or one of the first softwares that made containers very famous so when you are talking about containers talk about containers not about docker not about podman you should be talking about containers as the technology itself then you can pro probably learn how to build your own container images once you have already learned how to copy or use the container images from the docker registries or the public registries you can push your own new images to the registries make it publicly available and make it usable for other people there are so many tons of images that are out there that you can just pick and start using or build on top of those images you can also use something called source to image which is an open shift related tool that go that basically lets you go from your source code to an container image so that's another interesting tool to explore the last thing that you might want to learn is kubernetes or open shift those are the container orchestration technologies they are slightly different than what you do on your laptop when you are running a single container to run containers in production as a production software you need multiple containers working together and to basically have those deployed and working together is what is container orchestration and that's a next level in learning the container technologies so i hope that this entire presentation was very helpful and hope you learned something new today thank you so much for attending here's my contact information and i look forward to answer any questions that you have either here after this talk or offline and i hope that you have a great conference experience good day and want to take it over if you're here okay i am not seeing karan here he's the moderator for the session but i guess i'll take over uh thank you so much either for the talk it was amazing unfortunately we don't have time for a live q and a right now so if you have any questions please head to the breakout room under the expo and you can continue your discussions over there thank you all so much for attending